If you've been with us today, uh, if you've been with us, uh, this maybe today is your first day in a while. We've been walking through the book of Mark. Hux may tell you it's Job or something else in the Old Testament. I'm going to shoot straight with you because I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not a youth pastor and I don't tell stories. <laughs> I'm not taking you out to Outback, just so you know, or Disney, or no tickets like that. But we are in the book of, of Mark, and if you will turn there this morning, and while you're turning there, last week there was a discussion and readings of about Jesus feeding 5,000. That was 5,000 men, more like 15, 20,000 if you add women and children. Um, if you add women and children to that list. But it was a big deal. It was a big miracle. As a matter of fact, so much to the point that when John talked about it and referred to this miracle in his gospel account in chapter 6, John would go on to say that after this took, miracle took place that the people were ready to crown Jesus king. And so here we're in Mark chapter 6 today, in Mark 6, verse 45, and we were what we see is Jesus sending his disciples away after this miracle had been performed. And that's where we pick up this story today in Mark chapter 6, verse 45. So if you would read along with me this morning, that would be awesome. And it says, immediately after this, he's talking about the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and head across the lake to Bethsaida. While he sent the people home, after telling everyone goodbye, he went into the hills by himself to pray. Late that night, the disciples were in the boat in the middle of the lake, and Jesus was alone on the land, and he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling, struggling against the wind and the, ra- and the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. He intended to go past them. Now, I want you to mark a line, make a line up under that. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. I think it's really important. They're like, what, what is all, that all about? We'll talk about that. It says he intended to go past them in verse 49, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. And they were terrified when they saw him. Jesus spoke to them at once, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I'm here. And then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. And they were totally amazed, for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the the loaves. Their hearts were too hard to take it in. And then it finishes up that after they crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. They found, they brought the boat to shore and they climbed out. The people recognized Jesus at once and they ran throughout the whole area carrying sick people on mats to wherever they heard that he was. And Wherever he went, in the villages and the cities and the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplace, and they begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. So, here's another story involving Jesus, the disciples, a boat, some wind, and waves. Now, you would think that after the last boating experience that the disciples had wised up a little bit, right? I mean, you would think after what they had experienced the first time, they would have been just a little bit more cautious, but I guess that they were just gluttons for for, for punishment. But we can say that the storm is a representation of whatever specific challenge it may be that we might be facing or having to deal with. But one of the things that we learn in life is that with every storm, there's a lesson to be learned. Amen? Every storm that we walk through in life, there's a lesson to be learned. So a couple of back, a, year, a couple of chapters back, and when we looked at the last story of the, the storm, the disciples were with Jesus, and they learned at that moment in time in that storm that Jesus was not only God, but He was sovereign and He was Lord of all creation, and that they they could trust Him in whatever took place. That was what they learned in the last storm. So the question today is, what is it we're going to learn today? What is it that the disciples will learn? What is our takeaway as we look at this story? What is it that we can apply to our lives which will make a difference? And one of the first things that I want you to write down today and make note of is the fact that Jesus sometimes calls us into the storm. Amen? Sometimes he calls us into the storm. Just just like in the last story back in Mark, it was Jesus that insisted that the disciples get in the boat and head across the water. And this time it was the exact same thing. After everyone got fed, he sent them off, and then he told the disciples, listen, what I want you to do is I want you to head across the lake over to Bethsaida. He said this time there was a, it was a little bit of a difference because this time Jesus wasn't in the boat with them. They were alone. 
Instead, Jesus said, listen, you guys go across. Y'all head on across to the other side, and I'm going to go up to the mountainside to pray. And while they were up on, while Jesus was up on the mountainside praying, they're out on the water. Look at what it says in verse 48. He saw that they were in serious trouble. Notice that even though Jesus is up on the mountainside and he's praying, he notices, he sees that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and raves. And then it goes on to give us a detail. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came to them. Now, let's just make note of that time, three o'clock in the morning. Who's usually up at three o'clock in the morning? Let me see any early bird risers. Not too many people. Jack, you're odd. You're different. You're, you know, you're an anomaly. And so uh, it's three o'clock in the morning. That means if the disciples would have left after supper, let's just give or take a little bit of time, they've been out on the water for at least six hours. Are you with me? They've been out on the water for at least six hours struggling, rowing against the wind, rowing against the waves, and they were just doing what Jesus told them to do. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, there are consequences to every choice and every decision that we make, whether good or bad, and you can't escape them. I mean, that's just the way it is. And I would say that everyone listening to my voice today at some point in time has probably made a bad choice and had to experience the consequences of that choice. Amen? Amen? Amen. Yeah, and you'll probably make another one. Hopefully not. But that's that's just the way it is. As one guy said, storms follow sin. But the storm that this guy, that these guys were facing wasn't because of a foolish decision that they had made, but just the opposite. I mean, these guys weren't facing a storm because of their foolishness, but they were facing the storm because of their faithfulness. I mean, these guys were being obedient to what Jesus had asked them to do. And so this isn't the only example, though, that we find in Scripture where obedience leads to suffering. We see it scattered throughout the scriptures. I mean, you've got the Old, you've got the Old Testament characters like Job or, or Noah. I mean, this guy who was faithful and ended up experiencing this being made fun of for a hundred years and preparing, waiting on the storm, waiting on the, the water to come, and this boat that he had made out in the middle of nowhere. You've got the guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace of Daniel in the lion's den. And not one of those instances were the result of a foolish decision or rebellion against God. But the storms and the difficulties that they faced, it was all because of their faithfulness. Well, Jesus, is that what you want us to do? We'll do it. But as a result, there was a storm that, that followed, which reminds me that even though obedience leads to blessing, it doesn't mean that our lives are going to be free from storms. Amen? There are going to be storms in life. It's no different than the New Testament. I mean, you take the New Testament, especially when you think about the persecution of those disciples after Jesus would would leave and he ascended to heaven. Every one of the disciples would be persecuted and, and lose their life for their faith except for John. And every one of them would die because of their obedience to, to the Lord. And it was the same for Paul when he was writing to the church at Ephesus in 2 Corinthians. He would talk about some of the things that he would experience. And Paul went on to write about the sleepless nights and the fact that he had been hungry and he had been in prison and he had been beaten and he had been whipped and stoned and shipwrecked, facing death again and again and again because of faithfulness, because of his obedience to the Lord. And it was Paul that would go on to write in his letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy a little bit later, saying every person who wants to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will at some point be persecuted. And man, we complain when the air don't work. That's not persecution, people. That's not persecution at all. We complain when somebody talks about us. That's not persecution. You might think it is. These guys, their lives were were at stake. And yes, Jesus, who ended up being crucified himself, not because of his rebellion and what he and his attitude towards Rome, but Jesus was he was crucified because of his obedience to the Father and his love for us. Just because we find ourselves in the middle of a storm, it doesn't mean that we've deviated from God's plan at all, but it may mean that we're right in the middle of it. Amen? That's a low, low amen. 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 But if regardless if we understand the reason behind the storm or not, we still have to choose how we're going to respond. What are we going to do? Which leads me to my next thought today. 
That Jesus not only calls us into the storm sometimes, but he sees us in the storm. Going back to verse 48, there's a lot of things that we find just in that one verse. The Bible says, and and, uh, Mark recorded, it said, he saw, he saw. Well, what did he see? Jesus saw that they were in serious trouble. It says, rowing hard and struggling against the wind and the waves. That's a good word to underline, the word saw. And thinking about this just for a second. See, Jesus knew what was going on before whatever was going on would happen. He knew that. Jesus always sees. He sees past, present, and future. Nothing ever catches him off guard. Nothing ever surprises him. And here were the disciples in the middle of this storm, and they were personally experiencing the waves and the wind. And they saw the danger. And though, even though Jesus wasn't in the boat with them, he saw what they couldn't see. And don't ever forget this. When we walk through the times of difficulty, even though our sight may, may be limited, Jesus' sight isn't. He sees it all. He sees everything. And even though we might struggle to see him in the storm, we can trust that he sees us. Amen? Amen. That's a big deal. Jesus not only sees us, but you can also write this down. Jesus also prays for us. Going back and looking at verse 46, it says, After telling everyone goodbye, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. So here's Jesus. He sends home the crowd, all of these people, and he takes the disciples. He says, get in the boat and head over to Basada. And then he goes up to the mountainside to pray. Now, I'm not sure if he had his prayer list with him. I'm, I'm sure he had these things that he were praying, and I'm not really sure exactly what he was praying about. But while he was up on the mountain, one thing that more than likely than anything else that he was praying, I bet you he was praying for his disciples. Don't you think so? I I think he would have been there praying for his disciples because he not only knew the storm was coming because he sees, but he knew that their faith would be tested that night. He knew that their, their faith would be tested, that what they believed about him would be put to the test. And you know what we oftentimes say, faith isn't faith until it's tested. I mean, all of it, there's a lot of people say, man, I love Jesus. Yes, I do. I love Jesus. How about you? Until that difficult time comes. And then all of a sudden they turn tail and run. But here, Jesus knew. He knew that their faith in him, their trust in him would be Tested, And I love the picture of Jesus praying because it reminds me that in the storm, not only am I praying, not only may there be other people that are praying for me, but it also reminds me today that Jesus prays for me and he intercedes on my behalf. That in that moment in time when those struggles come, I can be assured that God knows and that he prays. And I don't want you to miss this. When you come to believe that Jesus is interceding on our behalf to the Father, it has a way of changing the way that we view the storms that we're walking through. Amen? When we come to understand that God sees and not only sees that He intercedes on our behalf, the storm that we're walking through, it has a way of changing. Our perspective, the way that He sees it, has a way of changing. Another important takeaway is this that we see in verse 48 again, is Jesus is the greatest need inside of the storm. So you got the disciples in the boat, and it goes on to say again in verse 48, he, being Jesus, saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard and struggling against those winds and waves. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning when Jesus came to them walking on the water. And then it says, that little piece that I told you to underline, then it says this, he intended to go past them. Well, what in the world's that all about? I mean, if I'm honest, it sounds like Jesus is trying to sneak around and, you know, and, and get around them without being seen. But I, that's not what it's talking about here. So, so, so what is it talking about? Listen to what I'm going to tell you because I think this is really helpful. So if you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the language of what's being spoken, when God's people were facing times of difficulty, when they were walking through difficult times, it was during that time, many times, that God would reveal himself in these new and unexpected ways, that he would reveal himself, his character, in greater ways than before. And we find here in our passage, in this passage, the same language that's used in the Old Testament, the words to pass by, or passing by, or to go past them. 
When you think about the story of Moses when he was leading the people out of Egypt because from out up underneath the Egyptians and the bondage that they were up underneath, it was Moses himself that cried out to God and he said, God, show me your presence. I want to see you. I want to know you. And this is how God responded to Moses in Exodus chapter 33. You can turn over there if you want to and just read the words up on the screen. But it says in verse, beginning in verse 19, the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness, here's that one of those words, pass, pass before you, and I will call out my name Yahweh before you, for I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone that I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. And the Lord continued on, look, look stand near me on this rock in verse 22 as my glorious presence passes by there's that word passes by I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by so we have this idea of passing or to pass by and it's the way that God spoke in reference to revealing his glory to Moses and look at what he goes on to say in the next chapter in chapter 34 It says, the Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out Yahweh, the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. And so not only do we see God's glory being revealed, but also we we see communicating, God communicating about his attributes, compassion and mercy, slow to anger, unfailing love, faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I will forgive iniquity and sin, but I will not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations. And look at the response of Moses in verse 8 there in chapter 34. Moses immediately threw himself to the ground and he worshiped. You know why? Because all of a sudden he saw the Lord in a way that he had never seen him before. He came to know God in a way that he never knew God before. Before, as the Lord passed by him, before him. Fast forward to the story of a man by the name of Elijah. A man by the name of Elijah who became very depressed and very discouraged, even, wanting, even to the place of wanting to take his own life. And in 1 Kings, we, we find how God revealed himself to Elijah there in chapter 19, verse 11 and following. He says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there, and the Lord, here's that word, that, that phrase, pass by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. And he goes on to say, but the... But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And it was during that time that Elijah came to recognize that God not only uses his power and his might to reveal himself, but also he uses a gentle whisper. And again, it happened when the Lord passed by, as we see in verse 11. So here's this pattern of of God's people experiencing these storms. And yet the storm isn't always a time of punishment, but God uses the storms to help us grasp a greater understanding of who He is and His character, His power, His mercy, His grace, and glory. In other words, and you've heard me say this before, we learn things about God in the storm that we would never learn otherwise. Amen? I don't like storms. I don't like them. I don't like storms at all. I mean, I would just rather that storm that they say that's out in the coast just goes right on out and dissipates. But the reality is that we, it, there are going to be those times that we, when we face storms, but in the storms of life, whatever they may be, that in those storms that there's an opportunity for us to learn things about the Lord, Lord that we would never ever learn in any other way. And so we've got the disciples, we've got them out on the water, in a boat, in a storm, and we have this same thought here in Mark in our story with Jesus walking on the water. And it says that he, he, Jesus, intended to go past them, which all of a sudden now brings on a whole new meaning. 
Because what's happening is Jesus is getting ready to reveal himself to his disciples so that they get a better glimpse of his glory and power. And look at what it says in verse 51. Don't miss it. He climbed into the boat. The wind stopped and they were amazed for they still didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves and their hearts were too hard to take it in. Now, in Matthew's account of this story, he, he, he tells it just a little bit more. See, Matthew, the Gospels, Matthew tells us also about this story. And in his account, he added that Peter cried out to the Lord, Lord, if it's you, tell me, tell me, Lord, and I'll get out of this boat and I will come to you. And Jesus said, well, come on, buddy. Come on. I mean, I mean just, just come right on, which he did. And, and he was okay until he, don't miss this, until he took his eyes off of Jesus and he focused back on the storm. And when he did that, what happened? He began to sink. He began to sink. And when Peter began to sink, he realized what was going on and he cried out, Jesus, save me, save me, which he did. And Jesus said, your faith is so small. Why did you doubt me? Uh Uh-oh, are you picking this up? Why do we doubt Jesus in the storm? Why is it when the storms begin to blow and the waves begin to come that all of a sudden that faith that we say that we have, in the midst of the difficulty, we cry out and our faith begins to waver? In Matthew's account, in Matthew 14, 32 and 33, it said that when they climbed into the boat, the wind stopped, then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. And you make note of this because this is really important because this is the first time we find that the disciples realized and confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And all of this happened because of a storm. He is who he says he is. He's Jesus. He's God. It was, it was in the storm that Jesus revealed himself, his power and his love. And it's no different than today. It's the same today. And not only can we come to learn about the Lord in the storm, but we also can come to learn that we can trust Him, realizing that He is our greatest need. The revelation of Jesus came as a result of the storm. See, a lot of times before the storm or when there's not a storm, we think it's all about us. I mean, man, I'm strong enough and I can handle it and I can make it work. But it's in the storm sometimes that God says, oh, no, maybe it's not all about me. And maybe I'm not strong enough and maybe I'm not powerful enough. And maybe I do need God. Our greatest need isn't for the absence of a storm or for our circumstances to be fixed as good as it might be. But our greatest need is to come to the place of understanding that God is sovereign and that he's in charge of it all, that we need Jesus. Amen? Amen. We need Jesus. Just a couple more quick thoughts and we'll be done this morning. The other thing I want you to understand is this, that in the storm, you aren't alone. Fifth thought would be this, Jesus is with us in the storm. Don't miss this. Um, The one that we need the most is in the storm with us. And so we got the place in the story that if we aren't careful, you'll miss this. And look at what again, back at verse 48, he saw that they were in serious trouble, rowing hard, struggling against the wind and the waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. We're at three o'clock in the morning when they would have been at their weakest and most vulnerable place, when they would have been ready to quit. Jesus shows up and don't miss this at their time of greatest need. When they thought that they were all alone and when they would have thought that everything was hopeless, Jesus was there and he's there for us as well. In those moments when we're struggling and we're fighting to survive, it's vital for us to remember that Jesus is with us even though it may feel otherwise. That he is with us in the midst of that storm. Look at verse 49. It says, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. Make note of this. There was no faith in their cry. When they cried out, there was no faith, yet Jesus still came to them. Isn't that something? Just as it says in the scripture, but God demonstrated his love that while we were still yet sinners, Jesus would give his life. He goes on to say, but Jesus spoke to them at once and he said, don't be afraid. Take courage. I'm here. 
to talk about God's kindness and his mercy, even in the midst of their doubts and fears. He chose to comfort them, to love them. Even when they were struggling to believe, I'm just reminded that in the weakest of my moments, in those times when I'm at the worst, Jesus said, don't be afraid. I got you, buddy. I got you. I got you covered. Which leads me to my last thought today, and then I close. Jesus will lead us through the storm. Jesus will lead us through the storm. Verse 51 says, then he climbed into the boat and the wind and stopped, and they were totally amazed. So they continued on. They get over to the other side and even the story. This story that we've read only takes us a few minutes. Let me tell you something. This storm that they were in lasted for a long time. It wasn't just for a few minutes, but this storm went on for hours. And they had to be thinking to themselves, is this ever going to end? Is this ever going to be over? And there may be some of you here today that are experiencing that the same. Is this ever going to be over with? I mean, am I ever going to make it through this? Will this ever end? And I I don't necessarily know the storm that you're facing. And I don't necessarily know what tomorrow brings, but I know who does. And the Bible says that he's with us in the storm. We can count on that. And you might say, well, Sid, how, how can I be sure? Because the Bible tells me so. The Bible tells me so. See, Romans 8, 28 says this, that we know that God causes everything or all things to work together. For what? For the good of those who love God and are calling towards His purpose for them. What is that purpose? That the God who sees everything and knows everything and is with me at all times is at work for my good as well as His glory. Did you know that? That sometimes God allows you to walk through the storms because he's got a purpose, because there's something he wants to teach you. And it may be because of something stupid that you've done. It might be. But then again, it may not be. It may just be because of your faithfulness and God's saying, listen, I want to deepen your faith. I want to deepen your understanding. I want to deepen your knowledge. When the storm arises, there will be things that we don't know. But one of the things that we can know for sure is based on what the Scripture tells us that without a shadow of a doubt that those of us that are willing to keep our eyes on Jesus that the Bible teaches us that He'll see us through that storm. Amen? He'll see us through the storm. You say, but Sid, okay. I I mean, that's what the Bible says. Listen, I've experienced it in my own personal life. He'll see you through the storm. I've been through a lot of storms. A lot of storms you don't even know. You have no earthy ideas, some of the storms. And I don't know the storms maybe that you've walked through, but I'll tell you this, Jesus has been there. And there have been some times I've not liked it, and some times I've told him I didn't like it. But I've continued to hold on, and I have come to learn in the midst of every storm, whatever it may be, that Jesus is there. He's there. Every time I've walked away from every storm up until this time in my life, knowing more about God's love, knowing more, coming to understand more about God's faithfulness and His provision and His protection. And so we see that Jesus was with His disciples in the storm. And I think today that what we want to take away is that Jesus wants to know, us to know today that He's with us in the, in the storm as well. And the story ends... Well, they make it to the other side, but there's more to the story. If you go ahead and read, I'm not going to read it for you today, but as it continues to the end, you see where more people, more sick people were brought to Jesus and Jesus healed them. But this story isn't just for us today, Jacinda. I mean, this story is for us. I mean, it's, it's here and it's for us. There's principles in here that we can take and we can apply to our lives, but I want you to understand that this story is also for other people. See, this story is also for other people that may be walking through a storm. I mean, how many of us, we may not necessarily be walking through a storm right now, but there may be somebody else that's walking through a storm that's within our sphere of influence. And to think that what we've learned today, that we can take those principles, these principles within God's Word in this story, and that we can share this story and these principles with somebody else and be an encouragement and walk alongside of them. But I mean, can you imagine what it's like for God, God in His creativity and God in His sovereignty, to allow us to be associated 
associated with somebody that might be walking through a storm and to recognize that our past experiences and God's word that we can, we can, uh, we can share that with them so that they themselves can be encouraged. You know, I thought about with it, getting ready to go back to school, the number of students that are going to face another student over these next few weeks that, are, that, that they're going to be able to take and share this story with them to encourage another student that may be walking through a difficult time. You know, I think about adults going back to work tomorrow and encountering somebody else that's walking through a difficult time. And here, do you now have something, a story that you can tell, some principles that you can share to encourage somebody that might be walking through a difficult time? time. There are people all around us that need to hear this. Amen? There's people all around us that need to hear this story that Jesus is for them. And just to think that God would allow your path to cross their path so that you could be a reflection and expression of his love. So as we close up today, as we finish up, I thought to myself, what better way than to do something out of the ordinary? Out of the ordinary, yet special. Something that was meaningful. Something that would would be helpful maybe to, to those that may be walking through a time of difficulty. So today, I just thought that maybe what we would do is is ending up our time this morning. Maybe you're here and maybe you're walking through a storm. Maybe you're walking through a time of difficulty. Or you maybe sense a storm on the horizon and you would love for us to pray for you. I just, what I want you to do today is I just, I like to ask where you are in the humility of the moment just to stand, would you? I'm walking through a storm. I see a storm on the horizon, something that's going on. And I just, I want to stand because I'm in need of prayer. Anybody? Don't look at the person next to you and see if they're going to stand. Take an evaluation of your own life. I got this going on. Maybe maybe it's not you, but maybe you've got a family member. Maybe you've got a friend that's struggling. And today, you're not not standing on your behalf, but you're standing on their behalf because you know what's coming. And your standing today is is just a reflection of, it's an indicator that I'm I'm in need of prayer. And it might be a prayer for strength. It might be a prayer for wisdom in reference to decision making. It might be prayer for rest that you need. It might be something else. Just want you to stand. Anybody else? Just a second. Nobody's going to ask you today what you're, what you're standing for. That's not, the, that's not the purpose of this. This is just standing. I'm in need of prayer. There's a storm. A sense of storm coming. I'm standing on behalf of somebody else. And maybe, maybe you have somebody that's standing near you today. And, and maybe you know them. Maybe you don't. Maybe just as a show of support, you might want to just stand up and just stand close to them. Maybe you've got somebody across the room that you know that's standing and you see them and you know what they're walking through. And you just want to go to them. I just You can do that right now. Maybe you put your arm on their shoulder. Maybe you just stand there quietly. Maybe you whisper a prayer. But you're standing It's just a show of support saying we were praying for you. Would you do that this morning? I'd love for every every person to have someone standing with them. I want to pray in just a second. But I'm reminded, I, I, I need Jesus. I, know the G, I need to know that Jesus is with me and that Jesus sees me and that he will lead me through the storm, that he won't forsake me. Maybe you're at home watching today and maybe you just want to stand right where you are. Your standing is just an indicator. Jesus, I need you. Would you join me in prayer as we close up with our time? Father, we praise you today as the one who sees everything. And Jesus, today I'm reminded that you see every person that is standing in this room and you know every circumstance of every person that is represented. And Jesus, we're also praying today for those that may not be here, but they're watching or listening online and in need of prayer. 
we know and we believe that you know everything. And today, may each person that's standing feel your, your love and your affection. And Jesus, whatever the need might be, I believe with all of my heart, based on Scripture and personal experience, that you're able to meet that need. Whether it's peace or hope or faith or rest, perseverance, strength or healing, I know and I believe that you are for us. Jesus, I want us to know today that we aren't alone. That we aren't alone in this battle, in this fight. Would you meet us where we are today? And for those that of us that are weak, would you give us strength? For those of us that are tired, would you give us rest? For those of us that are struggling with anxiety and worry, may you give us confidence and courage. Would you surround us with people that will, that will embrace us and love us and walk with us during this season and time? Where there's a physical struggle, Jesus, where you heal. Where there's a need for decision making, would you give wisdom? Today, Father, would you remind each of us that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be fearful. But you're with us. And that we can trust you. That regardless of whatever situation it may be that we're facing, that you're there. And that you're at work in all things for our good and for your glory. And in those moments and times that some of us may be having to wait, would you strengthen our faith and help us to persevere during that moment of silence? And along that path and that journey, would you help us to know you better? Today, Jesus, our prayer is a declaration of our desperate need for you. And Lord, the truth is, is that we look forward to that day that there won't be any more death or sorrow or pain or suffering and that day is coming. That day that there won't be any more stresses or storms. Father, today we declare and we praise You. And Lord, today we, we um, acknowledge that You are our source of strength. And You are our source of comfort. And Jesus, we desire to trust You with all of our heart. So would You show up? Would You show up? And in the questions and in the doubts and in the fears, would we come to know you better? And at the end of it, one day when we look back, may there be a story to tell of your faithfulness that will be an encouragement for those following in our footsteps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, as you guys are getting ready to walk out, let me just say this right here. The blessing is not in the absence of the storm. It's in the presence of Jesus. As you go out these doors this week, will you go make a difference? Will you do that? And will you be Jesus to this world that desperately needs Him? Bless you.